Who knew? Who knew? Uh, let's hear about that leap from Bloomberg to Ripple. Yeah. Um, so I've been covering technology here in Silicon Valley for about 20 years. Uh, there was, it was a good stretch. I was a money manager as well. But I've uh, at a couple of hedge funds here in the Bay Area. But I've been up close and seen a lot of high growth technology companies um, from the start. And companies that, you know, I've watched before, the, before there was a Google. There was no Google. I watched Google become Google, right? I've watched Facebook come from nothing and to be something uh, massive and big. Uh, I've watched Salesforce. Now the, the tall, you know, a block from here, one of the tallest buildings, west, the tallest building west of Chicago, Salesforce Tower. Uh, that camp, company came out of nowhere in the last few years. And so, you know, when I look at what's happening in blockchain, I started to see this kind of technology that really is, it seems to me, the kind of transformative technology uh, that was similar to the things we saw in cloud software, the similar to the things that we saw in the early days of the internet and search and so on. And so um, uh, when I watched Ripple sort of emerge as you know, one of the leading, if not the leading company in crypto, um, it looked like a really intriguing story. What's coming up, Michelle? We're going to be talking about a number of things, including, including two entrepreneurs not those guys, who say they have a new and cheaper way to go about getting broadband. That must be them there with Corey Johnson. CNBC's Corey Johnson will have a live report after this. Seen live in North America, Latin America, Europe, South Africa, the Middle East, and the Caribbean. Welcome back. Coming up this half hour, we have uh, the latest a story out of Silicon Valley. Maybe you've heard this story already. A couple of uh, entrepreneurs, scientists who say they have found a cheaper, much cheaper way of gaining broadband access to the Internet. CNBC's Corey Johnson has tracked them down. He'll have that story for us coming up in a few minutes. Making headlines this Tuesday. Michelle, I understand that your next story is about a different kind of band, right? That's right, broadband. You're good, Leslie. <laughs> Speaking of which, two entrepreneurs say they have a new way to go with broadband. Their plan is structured around the wireless data standard called Wi-Fi. CNBC's Corey Johnson caught up with these two men in Silicon Valley, and they joins us now with more. Hey, Corey. It's the Silicon Valley garage band story, and an old one. <laughs> at that. Well, these guys are getting a lot of attention since they popped up in the New York Times yesterday. Two guys tinkering around in their Silicon Valley garage have come up with a wireless internet solution that goes hundreds of times farther than today's technology. It sounded pretty incredible, so I got in my car yesterday and drove down there yesterday afternoon to check it out. And guys, it's pretty cool. Lane Holt has been tinkering around in his garage for years. A few years ago, he came up with a software solution that actually might revolutionize the internet. Using off-the-shelf components he assembles in his garage, Holt has created a mini internet network. Now, the network enables a high-speed internet connection just like you might get with DSL or a cable modem, but this connection is wireless. In fact, he hooked up his neighbors as willing guinea pigs, even though they're getting it for free. Also interesting is that these guys did this without any venture capital funding. These two guys approached VC to the idea about two years ago, just as wireless internet investments were going out of fashion. The VCs rejected them, so they've done it all on their own on less than $200,000 in private investment. Guys? Wow. Innovation is not dead in Silicon Valley, after all. It's just gone uh, underground and back to the garages where it started in the first place. Thanks, Corey. See you later. You. Corey Can you talk to us a little bit about the altcoin market? Well, what we, saw, what we saw today is that across the board, all of these sold off. We saw Bitcoin decline by about 2.5%. We saw uh, uh, Ethereum, Ripple, Litecoin all down today, 1.5% to 2%. Uh, but the, the total size of these market capitalizations, as we just heard in that soundbite, are sort of mind-boggling. Uh, interestingly, Ripple, uh, and we're going to have the CEO of Ripple on a uh, forward promote. Uh, get ready, get, hold on to your seats. The CEO of Ripple is going to come on next week to talk about this. But see, the Ripple awesome. actually con uh, uh, controls most of the Ripple currency, and they've decided as they build a real business around the currency and around the blockchain technology, they're going to sell off those pieces of Ripple in a sort of a regular uh, fashion to kind of take that risk out of their business and let people know what's coming into the marketplace. But on some level, it seems to me that what Ripple's saying is we don't want to be in the business of holding on to coin. We want to be in the business of, of actually um, uh, allowing this to be used in some uh, interesting ways so business can transact on the Ripple network.
drill down, we dig into the company news behind a stock on the move. Now, shares of Sony down 15% in the last year, another 2% today. Could have been worse since the company pre-announced a surprise of $2 billion loss. But the Sony loss tells us quite a bit about the danger of the world we live in. Think about this. In the last few weeks, Sony has suffered from both an earthquake, a tsunami, and one of the most devastating corporate cyber attacks ever. Well, the U.S. government's also reportedly cozying up to Internet service providers to so tries to stop cyber spying from China. Government shared Internet addresses linked to Chinese hackers with American telecom companies earlier this year, according to The Wall Street Journal. So how this, did this reduced amount of, uh, or this sharing reduce cyber spying at all? Let's bring in Richard Baitlick, who's the chief security officer at Mandiant, a cybersecurity firm that's published several reports on Chinese hacking activity. Uh, Richard, what... How long has this been going on? Do, is there a lot of sharing back and forth here, or is this groundbreaking news? Control for reality. If you see Chris Dancy it. walking down the street, he looks like a normal guy, all time. but he's secretly recording everything, and I mean everything. He's wearing a Wahoo Blue heart rate monitor, a Nike fuel band pedometer, something called the Body Media Fit that measures his skin temperature, movement, and sweat dissipation. He even wears a Zeo sensor on his head while sleeping. His Google Calendar tracks everything, every meeting, every phone call, every interaction, every skin reaction, all quantified. Why? Well, gosh, um, you know, ever since I was a little kid, my, my dad would like measure my height on the back of a door. Like, and like, I grew up, like, quantified. And now, Dancy aims to be the world's most quantified man. How do I quantify my digital existence? Dancy, an executive at BMC Software, thinks he's on the cutting edge of the future of work. Most of us who are in first world nations, we don't really do much for work. We spend all our day in our inboxes in some sort of office suite. We don't really produce anything. And I think if we could actually quantify the actual work we do, like how much time do you spend in all these other systems? We would actually create patterns and teams and workflow that would actually reinvigorate the economy. By measuring everything, he thinks he can capture the environment in which he's most productive. The right music, the right amount of sleep, the most attuned mental acuity, and the failings of technology inspire Dancy as much as anything, particularly the uselessness of email. Email is more of a weapon. It's like somebody else's to-do list for you. From Dancy's perspective, early tech mimicked a pre-tech experience, but he believes he's living in the future, a tech world where entirely new things are possible. Now it's been confirmed. Deja vu. Well, yes, it is confirmed uh, at less than a billion dollars, as if that's a value. But this is a business, I think, that's not widely known outside of the world of gamers, but it's so important in the world of gaming. Uh, Amazon spending $970 million. We expect them to take that as a, as a long-term acquisition uh, on their cash flow statement, so it won't really affect uh, cash flow from operations, of course. It'll, it'll take a chunk out of the balance sheet there. But uh, a very interesting acquisition for them, as you can see them trying to build up their, their streaming video business. There is possibly nothing hotter in streaming video, and I will include Netflix in that, nothing hotter than Twitch doing 42 billion uh, minutes, actually it's 42 million users Hang on, in, in there's the last nothing quarter. hotter in streaming video. Yeah, I think that's the case, and I really think that the, the Including volume, everything. Including everything, yes. I think that, look, what do you mean everything? You're thinking of, look, the, the numbers that these guys are putting up and the, and the duration, the length of time that people are watching this uh, is really unique in the streaming business and presents a, a terrific opportunity for advertisers to advertise against us. As we know, Amazon also building out their advertising platform. Now they've got the content to do it with. It's, it's an issue that I have. I've, I, most of my time at Bloomberg, I've been faced, uh, focusing on, on the technology uh, arena and not on Fed policy. Now that I'm doing this radio show every day, I, I spend a lot of time talking about Fed policy. But I haven't, I've spent a lot of time doing work on what's going on with the economy. I haven't looked for conspiracies among the Fed governors about why they might not be raising rates or in, indeed why they're, they've kept rates so low. Hi, thank you. But for I'm open to if you if you have some reasons I don't know about. 
Hi, thank you for coming. I'm a filmmaker in New York. We have lots of things, similar cases like the in film industry, because people don't sign contracts. So I'm I'm curious about how uh, you advise on doing due diligence on people, because oh, yeah, yeah. uh, I think oftentimes you could find their um, profile online right. or all kinds of from your friend, but could still be a you know a fob. Put this into context for us. Instagram doing better than Twitter. How does it face up to its parent company, Facebook? Um, and also, are international users as valuable as domestic users? Uh, all great questions. Let's address a few of those. So first of all, the, the numbers we get from Instagram are given out in a very sort of peculiar way. They'll tell us in a press release when they get to the number, but they don't report in their quarterly filings. They don't report it when Facebook reports earnings. I, I should say Facebook, of course, the parent company to Instagram, having purchased Instagram back in 2012. But what we know is you know, at the end of December, they gave us this 300 million, uh, or the middle of December, this 300 million user number. And then today we get this number of 400 million. And you can see the growth rate, while it's still much smaller than Facebook, uh, you can see that it's not only growing really fast, it's, grow it's grown to be something even bigger than Twitter. And that's important for Instagram because they're, they're just starting to find ways to monetize this and, and use the way that people are clicking on those pictures so often and using mobile to do so uh, much more than on the desktop. But uh, Instagram being very sort of uh, judicious in their use of advertising and their monetization of the business. David, don't you wish just once he would say, this is the second best iPhone ever. The yeah, iPhone 4 is great. One. <laughs> yeah. But no, they, of course it's the best phone ever. Why would they try to, you know. But uh, there's some interesting developments they talked about with this phone uh, that I think are important. So as it relates to the phone, uh, and maybe one of the most important things is just the performance of the phone. So I haven't upgraded my phone in two years, right? So this phone that I got two years ago, the phone they're announcing today, uh, adhering uh, exactly with Moore's Law, 24 months later, is twice the performance and half the power consumption. Uh, so important for this phone to do a little bit more and to do all the things that they want to do in terms of, among other things, uh, processing audio better. I'm Corey Johnson, digital currency ripple, breaking out of Bitcoin shadow. It's how you exploded over the last week, really over the last year. It is in the leading uh, uh, cryptocurrency of the entire year. Uh, really stunning stuff. Brad Gerlinghouse, CEO of Ripple, joins me now from New York. Brad, always a pleasure to talk to you, and I've said that for years talking to you. I didn't have any idea that Ripple was going to become the kind of thing that it has become here. Um, and and it's, it's interesting to me because you're so focused on having a, a functioning business built around blockchain but you've also got this big honk and valuable currency uh, that you guys have a lot of. There's no question, and I think as some of your earlier uh, participants, you know, said, there's a lot of hype in this space. But I think there's also a, a, lot, of, a lot. There's a lot of hype, but there's a lot of reality. And Ripple's been very focused on how do we create real utility and solve a real problem. And in this case, it's a, for cross-border payments, which is a multi-trillion-dollar problem. And if we could reduce the friction there using blockchain technologies, we think we can create a lot of value for consumers, for banks, for the whole ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing of going to an ATM, anyone who travels overseas and goes to an ATM machine and sees the massive fees slapped on there just to access their own money, often from the same bank that they use for in their native country, knows what a problem this is, let alone the huge businesses that Western Union and others have moving currency. But it looks like you're looking far beyond that, I guess, into actually what the banks themselves are paying. You know, even within the banking community, there's a few banks that kind of sit on the top of the entire global payments infrastructure. And all the other banks end up paying them to help settle the global liquidity that's required for commerce, for small businesses, for retail. And across the board, it's kind of amazing that we still live in a world where to send money to London today, the fastest thing for you or I to do would be to drive to, well, for you, for SFO, for me here in New York, to JFK or Newark, and fly the money to London. Hey everyone, Tony here. Got another video for you, and it's actually just this was just announced. Ripple has hired Corey Johnson as their chief marketing strategist. Um, he was from Bloomberg TV, and uh, his role it says here his job will be to explain the company Ripple and the currency XRP to investors. So notice XRP is mentioned because Ripple, as I've been talking about. Their goal is to get XRP adoption. They're not just sitting on XRP, and I know people have been 
the fudsters just go around saying no one will overuse XRP, even though MoneyGram and Western Union are testing it. We have a bunch of money transfer companies who have already gone live with it. Um, some some banks are using it, not all, but their goal is to get those folks to use XRapid, which XRP runs on. So Ripple's CEO Brad Garlinghouse, um, as mentioned, this was just announced. They he just um, tweeted this about 13 minutes ago. He says Corey has seen it all from the dot-com bubble through the crypto wild west no one is more qualified to analyze the impact and the role of xrp crypto and blockchain within the markets at large as the internet of value is actualized so get ready guys get ready they're making a push to help people understand about xrp and this is what it's going to take right as a real company they have to market Welcome back to Morning Trade Live on the TD Ameritrade Network, live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. As we mentioned, the Consensus Conference, a big couple of days for crypto enthusiasts, investors, and developers joining us to help cover this and get us started on the crypto front in the next couple of minutes. This is Corey Johnson, the Chief Market Strategist at Ripple, yeah. and uh, full disclosure, a former uh, colleague. Corey, yes. thanks so much for coming in. Good to see you, too. Absolutely. So you guys have a piece of news today, and I want to get to that. But first, tell me what a Chief Market Strategist at a crypto company, a crypto yeah. token does. Yeah, so Ripple's probably one of the largest, not the largest company in the space, if you will. And it's not a complicated, it's, a, it's an enterprise software company. Yeah. But we also sit on a ton of this cryptocurrency called XRP. Uh, XRP was created before the company Ripple, but nonetheless, we, we own a, a, a big chunk of that. So we're doing a lot of things to help solve for this really big problem, this rid ridiculous problem. And I can send a text message to Sao Paulo in three seconds full of emojis and lots of necessary information about, you know, or a picture of what I had for breakfast. Yeah. I can send a, an email full of information with a spreadsheet to Cape Town in three or four seconds. But if you want to send money to, I don't know, to, to Mexico City, the fast way to do it is put it in a suitcase and take it there because it takes days and it costs hundreds of basis points. So yeah. Ripple fundamentally is just an enterprise software company that solves for that problem. Part of my job is to sort of tell that story to investors and to Wall Street and, and the regulators around the world. So let's talk about Ripple. Uh, and I want to start with the difference between Ripple and XRP. Can you kind of define that for us? Really simple. Ripple's an enterprise software company. XRP is a digital asset that trades on its own, that's owned by lots of people in lots of places. We happen to own a lot of XRP. We've also owned a lot of cash. We own a lot of shares. We own a lot of computers. But the company is called Ripple and we sell software. So if I were to ask you, as I am right now, about right. XRP prices down 75%, right. I mean, do you have opinions on what's driving those declines? Uh, it's, a, it's a market dynamic that I can't begin to understand. Um, the, you know, Ripple, the software company, has had the best quarter ever. We've signed more deals, struck more partnerships, we have more banks using our software than ever before, over 100 banks in production using our software. XRP, is a, the price of XRP has fallen, as you mentioned, 70% in the quarter. Um, so they're sort of non-correlated, but we think that if our business has success and other businesses have success that use XRP, it'll start to create an intrinsic value in XRP that I think that other um, cryptocurrencies or tokens, whatever you call them, don't actually have. But, but maybe you guys like that there's some sort of barrier between, you know, the software and the, the currency, if you will. Yeah, I mean, we can like it or not like it, but they're just, they're just different animals. I mean, mm. XRP is a, is a digital asset that's its own thing that we happen to own a lot of. We would like to see it do well. We've got about 61 billion reasons we'd like to see it do well, and I hope that it does, it does so over time. We've just finished the blockchain panel, and how did it go for you? Uh, it was a great panel. It was interesting. A lot of different point of views. I think, you know, explaining blockchain to people who aren't in blockchain can be very confusing. I use, uh, it's actually a line I use a lot, but if you ask someone in blockchain what time it is, they tell you how to build a watch. And it's true. So I thought that panel did a great job of actually explaining some of the most basic ideas about blockchain and then some very specific use cases where it would actually have value, not just squiggly lines on a chart on CNBC. So now when you look at blockchain and the innovation that you see for it in the future, what do you think it's going to transform the most? Well, I think that, you know, the, that question was put to everyone in the room and, and all these 
financial services people said, oh, it's going to be financial services. I think if you filled the room with farmers, the farmers would say, I can see so many uses, it'll be agriculture. But I really do think that finance is the place where there is the most friction in our global economy and the solutions presented by blockchain are so obvious that they're really going to change the way money and value move in our society. So how do we get people ready for that? People are ready for it now. People are sick of paying highest charges. People are sick of taking, you know, why does it take three or four days to move money across a border when I can send a text message in five seconds? That's, that's unacceptable in this society. And I think people are ready for that change right now. Are the regulators ready? I think the regulators are trying to figure out the speculation on the cryptocurrencies and the digital assets. And that has the regulators still scared about what blockchain might be in some cases. But I've got to say, like, uh, and I, I'm honestly surprised, my opinion of government has not always been that high. But the, when, when we meet with regulators, I, I, I personally have been really surprised by how much they know and how much they really want to know. Um, they don't seem to walk into this with sort of this notion of fear and doubt. They actually want to listen and learn. So what do you think is the realistic timeline for us? Well, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that can happen in this, but the entrepreneurs aren't waiting. Entrepreneurs all over the world are developing solutions, using blockchain, using digital assets. And, and you know, we, we see, we, for example, we use a digital asset called XRP. We see lots of other entrepreneurs using XRP. Now, we're further ahead than they are, but they're not waiting for government, and they're not waiting. And if, and if the governments that are hostile to these solutions don't become unhostile, they're going to pick up and go somewhere like Singapore, like, like Switzerland, like Malta, like uh, uh, Liechtenstein, uh, like Estonia, who have really embraced these technologies and, and want to see those businesses grow. The world is more global than ever before, and entrepreneurs are going to pick up and leave and go to the places where there's technologies. Uh, they, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to de develop technology anymore. I still think it's the best place, but there's more options now.